The Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, FCTS, on WK yesterday cautioned the public against the practice of paying ransom to bandits and kidnappers because, on the contrary, it encourages the scourge. This was as the federal government had warned against crowdfunding in support of ransom payments to kidnappers by relatives of victims, saying there was an extant law against it. WK also promised to go on hot pursuit of the bandits constituting a nuisance for the residents of FCT and making life miserable for them. The minister said this while addressing community leaders, traditional rulers and stakeholders at a town hall meeting in Buari Area Council, which has recently become the epicenter of kidnapping activities. Tunji Olanikbeku files this report. After days of intense meeting with security agencies, both at the minister's level and the presidency, the minister of FCT, Mason Wiki, is here in Buari to meet with residents of the area. Wari Area Council is the most troubled area council in the last few months where kidnappers have been terrorizing the residents at will, abducting residents and demanding millions of naira in ransom. But at this town meeting, the minister is assuring the people that all the activities of kidnappers and bandits will be checked by government henceforth. Security is one of the key priorities that Mr. President is leading the group agenda will want to face squarely. It is no longer going to business as usual. Everything has to be done to protect life and property. Without protection of life and property, then we have no business to be in government. My coming here to, today is to assure you that we are very, very serious. We are very, very serious. All those criminals, bandits, enough is uh, enough. Present at the event is a former lawmaker who once represented the Federal Capital Territory, Philip Aduda, the Buari Council of Chiefs security agencies and officials of the area council. The minister who commiserated with the people of Wari on the unfortunate recent incident promised the determination of the federal government to tackle the issue headlong. Without information, that's not what we can do. And that is where you have to play key role. Traditional decision, you have a role to play. Community leaders, you have a role to play. Because by information, you have the security agencies to proactively take control before anything will uh, happen. And so in the next few days, you will see the action of the security agencies to make sure that this kidnapping is brought to a halt. The Buari community, while appreciating the efforts of government to restore peace, requested more security presence in the area council. I'm appealing to the Honorable Minister. From the rural area, somewhere like Ibu Sheri Kau, I'm appealing, Honorable Minister, of tender my request of appealing since 2019 and 2020 that we are requesting for Mimi Barak along the Sheri Kau Ibu Azi. I'm still appealing to the Honorable Minister that we need area command in Buari so that it will help us in terms of security aspect. With promises made by the minister, the people of Buari can only hope that they will henceforth be able to sleep peacefully. Right, uh, Vimbai, actions being taken following the public outcry of the incessant kidnappings in the Federal Capital Territory. Your take on this story.
Right. Now, I mean, it's important to begin by acknowledging the fact that this is the action we want to see. This is a step in the right direction. Albeit, of course, we have uh, spoken about the reactionary nature of the actions being taken. But nevertheless, justice delayed is not justice denied. At least action is being taken. However, when we speak of the issue of ransom, we know it's illegal. We know it should not happen. But what it reflects is a trust issue in our system. Do people trust the fact that the system will be there to save them, that the system will step in for them? Uh, I want to recall a story uh, from early last year when a Zimbabwean farmer was kidnapped in Kaduna. And the very, very quiet nature, secretive and private nature with which the exchange happened, and he was returned. Uh, however, everything was kept extremely, extremely discreet. Now, they had the, the privilege or the luxury, shall I say, of being able to keep uh, this, uh, this negotiation discreet. How many people have that luxury? Uh, so it's difficult, you know, to, people are caught between a, a rock and a hard place because as much as you want to be discreet, you want to follow the rules and the laws, but say that to a mother, say that to a father, say that to a sister, a wife, a husband, who will, who's ready to do anything to make sure that their family member's life is preserved and that they're returned home safely. Uh, so, yes, it's important to remind people that, you know, it shouldn't be done in, in, in a wailing nature, if I may use that word. Let's not run to the press, to the media, to social media and so forth. However, this is a reflection of a trust issue. So on the other side, we need more of these interventions so that people do feel that the system will be there when they need it most. All right. Thank you. Rufai. So uh, this is largely reactionary. And that's what I don't understand in this country. We've been talking about kidnapping in Abuja since the start of this administration. Now we're having a town hall meeting. Kudos to the minister. But the truth has to be said, what has been done to bring solution to the problem? It's not by having town talk meetings and talk shops here and there. We talk too much. Analysis paralysis. What has been done as regards the situation? Mr. Arias' child was killed. What has been done? The bandits are still asking for ransom. What has been done? Nabeda's family, people still off. What has been done? We want to see action. The IGP set up SIS, all those things are just talk shop. Yes, they launch new equipment to face uh, kidnappers. All those things are talk shop. We want to see action. Has the minister even reached out to the families involved as we speak today? Is there a direct contact? Is there a pathway to psychosocial support? While intelligence work and intelligence reconnaissance is going on to ascertain what is going on with the kidnappers as we speak? What is being done? You see, it's one thing to be reactionary, to hold stakeholders for up. There's no point packing the hall full there. You can go to those people in their communities. That's not what's going to solve the problem. What we're going to solve, solve, solve the problem is a lasting solution to the problem, which is through action. As we speak today, have they set up a sustainable security plan for those areas? You can see the Sarkin Bwari there talking about how it'd been calling for a while for at least some sort of barracks to be around there. What has been done as regards that? Is there a rapid response system? Those are the things we call action, not talk shops, not reactionary talk shops. Because like I said yesterday, for every day that goes by, we're giving these kidnappers the advantage of time. It makes it harder. It's so easy for them to say, don't pay ransom. So we do not support payment of ransom or crowdsourcing for ransom. But the question is, what have they done to get the people out? Most of the time, I can very much bet they have left the family to their own devices. So if they have not done anything and they're saying people should not talk as regards paying ransom, what are they doing? 
You want to give kudos, yeah, kudos on the talk shop, but it's just a talk shop. This is nothing to be able to solve the problem. We want to see solutions. Yes, solutions. And uh, again, like has been said, a number of things have happened since the outcry by the public, especially with regards to the kidnapping, the space of kidnapping in, uh, in Abuja, especially in the Buari Area Council. Yesterday, that um, footage you saw was to a town hall meeting on insecurity held in the Buari Area Council, attended by the minister of the FCT. In fact, he said that it was so important for him to be there that as that was happening, the FEC, the Federal Executive Council meeting was happening, but the president told him, mandated him to be present at the uh, you know, town hall meeting just to demonstrate the seriousness of the federal government and their commitment to ensuring that they are facing this insecurity challenge in the FCT head on. And so that was a good move in terms of the, um, you know, just a show of seriousness by the federal government. Since um, this week, from this week alone, the president has held a high-powered um, security meeting with security chiefs across different boards. Uh, the FCT minister himself had met with area councils um, in, Abu in Abuja. Uh, the inspector general of police, Sky Degbetokun, had launched the SIS, which is an elite arm of the, of the police force, and this was to you know, ha address head-on the insecurity challenges, and it was meant to be a spe special elite force. Um, SIS is um, the Special Intervention Squad, was launched, I believe, yesterday. So just to highlight some of the things that have happened, a lot of movement has happened since, and, and fantastic on the, on the side of the government. Quoting Governor Yeson Wike yesterday at the meeting, he had mentioned that without the provision of security for life and property, the government has no other business, and I quite agree with him on that note. If the federal government or if the government or a government is unable to provide the basic um, security of life is, lives and property, then that government has no business being in government. And so the importance of this is being highlighted. However, beyond this and beyond the uh, movement now, The Guardian reports earlier today that no fewer than 300 people have been kidnapped in the FCT since February of 2023. Out of those 300 people, 45 have been killed. However, I took the deaths of these two young girls, Nabiha and Folonsho, Nabiha Alkadria and Folonsho Ario, because we must give a name to these young Nigerians, young girls who lost their lives. It took their deaths and the kidnapping in the Buari Area Council to get the, to galvanize the government to action. Like Vimbai said, it's never too late. However, we hope that the girls who are still in um, who are still in kidnappers' custody will be released. I do agree with the federal minister as well, that the federal um, capital territory minister, that when it comes to ransom, like we mentioned, yes, we might not have a choice when it comes to this because as a family member, all you want is for your ward or your child or for your relative to be out of the kidnapper's den. However, we also empower kidnapping by doing this publicly and making it seem as if it has become a lucrative business and people are crowdsourcing or crowdfunding to be able to fund a criminal activity. Yes, if this is being done as government, maybe perhaps if the government would step in and help the families init you know, initiate conversations, then that might, be hap that might be better. Or better still, if the federal government can rescue the girls so that there's no need to even pay ransom or rescue the children and all those in captivity so there's no need to pay ransom. Nobody wants to pay ransom. In fact, for some of these families, they've not been able to get the amount of money needed to pay this ransom. It is, it is, um, it is quite a heavy financial task. So what we are enjoining the, the federal government and the government to do is to do this rescue these girls, bring them back, and then we can be, continue to speak about securing Abuja and the rest of Nigeria so that we don't have to see these occurrences happen again. Moving on to our next story. A federal high court in Abuja has declared null and void the provisions of the Nigeria Broadcasting Code, which authorizes the NBC to impose fines on broadcast stations for alleged breaches of the code. The court ruled that the regulatory body cannot exercise judicial powers. The court also issued an order of perpetual injunction restraining the NBC from acting or further imposing any fine on any broadcast station in Nigeria. 
The judgment follows a suit by the media rights agenda against NBC following the commission's imposition of fines of 5 million naira each on a television station and three paid TV platforms in 2022 for allegedly undermining Nigeria's national security by broadcasting documentaries on banditry in Nigeria. The court held that the NBC acted above its powers by imposing such fines. The court, however, refused to grant the organization's claim for 700,000 naira's costs it incurred in litigating the action. Another claim for 2 million naira as general damages for NBC's infringement on its rights, as well as a request for 1 million naira as punitive damages for the commission's conduct. Vimbai, NBC cannot <laughs> find. I, I shouldn't be too excited. I, I mean, I'm too excited for uh, this news, but let me temper my excitement yes. and ask you. Well, to come. well, we know that you're not violating anything yeah. and you don't intend to do so. And, and generally, it's a responsible environment. Yeah. It's a responsible environment. This is sweet music to our ears, uh, Ayo. It, it, it's brilliant news. And because what we do is we end up uh, heading in the direction of gagging. Now, that is the beginning of a very, very uh, tragic situation, especially towards our democracy. We need a robust press. We need a free press. We need an environment where we can exchange ideas freely so, responsibly so as well. However, we, once we are unable to freely ch exchange our ideas and communicate with one another, communicate with the nation at large, how do we move forward? How do we chart a way forward for this great nation? So it's very important for us to be able to feel free as we do our work, to feel, you know, the smile on Ayo's face, the joy in her life as she comes to work. And she's not worried about whether there will be freedom. You know, they say you, you have freedom, freedom, of ex freedom to speak, but not freedom after you yes. speak. Um, so very important to know that our freedom, uh, in fact, doesn't end where our nose starts, that truly we are protected. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Truly, we are protected. We're So, Ayo, yes, I can feel that air of triumphalism by some, you know, as regards this NBC judgment, but I also want us to look at it critically. One, because hitherto, I have always argued that the way the NBC is structured as we speak is not fit for purpose. It's very draconian, has its roots in the military, and tries as much as possible to gag the press if care is not taken. And it has to be said. And I remember the NSAS incident when this station was fined. And I also like to probably, if we can test the law and see that others that have been fined too prior to this time, is that going to be, you know, a, a retrospective action of some sort? Because this was how the NBC came out and said that the videos that were published during NSAS was a lie. And I remember then the DJ of NBC, I asked him, what tools did the embassy use to verify and investigate those videos? He couldn't see anything. So it has now become an underarm of the Ministry of Information. And if they don't like your face, they push the MDC against you. But for you to have a robust democracy, you must have many stakeholders in the Broadcast Commission, women's group, CSOs and the likes, so that there are robust conversations and this should not be kept under government. It should be free, as it is done in some other parts of the country, in the world. And that's why there will always be loggerheads. Going back to the documentary, that was the documentary on the banditry in Zamfara. And this was a proper investigative work done. But the NBC claimed, yes, that the investigator was supposed to incite and promote it said, no, there was no way it was going to promote any form of insurgency. It was a good creative work done. And the NBC went ahead and slammed fines. But now the court is saying that you can't have any rights because you can't be a judge in your own case. You can't make the laws and implement the laws and slam fines. It's not done. So I hope the NBC will learn from it. And the NBC should stop being that tool in the hands of you know, government, as it were, to be able to attack those that speak against them. Because we see this happen way too many times. It is the only embassy that would investigate the matter. They are the ones that would prefer sanctions. And they've been doing this so much. And kudos to the MRA that decided to go and test that in court. And that's why I call on Nigerians, please go and test 
your rights in court. Because if he had not tested that in court, we would not have gotten to the end of the matter. And the judge indeed had very strong words for the NBC. But it still goes back to the way the NBC was set up. And this model is not fit for purpose in a democracy if we truly want to have a robust media. And we as journalists will do our work, just like how some people say the reportage of kidnapping is glamorizing kidnapping. No, it's not. If kidnapping had not happened in Abuja, we can't just manufacture the story. We report it based on what is happening at the request on ground. And we also put guardrails in, indeed. And some of the guardrails are things like, yeah, we don't support payment of ransom. Well, we have to also be objective enough to be able to say, okay, what are the alternatives? It is the government job to try to hide things from us. It is the media's job to be able to reveal those things the government is hiding. And it is the embassies to be fair in regulating us. So this is another one. And this is a challenge to all of us if we truly want to build a society. All right, uh, that, justice, that judgment was delivered by Justice um, Ophelia Ajumogobia, Arozo Ophelia Ajumogobia, and it was instituted um, in the courts by, on behalf of the media, um, of the MRA, by a Mr. Omulu from Abuja. And that judgment also set a precedent, perhaps, as people are now looking at other regulatory agencies that have imposed fines in the past, as to would this judgment then mean that they also are unable to, um, to impose a fine. So agencies like the NCC, um, responsible for communication, and then we also have agencies like the FCPC, who recently imposed a fine on of you know, million. On, on $10 million. So these are also questions that must be asked around the fact that would this be exclusive to the NBC or to other regulatory agencies who also impose fines based on the... Um, judgment or the ruling of, of the federal court. So these are some questions that would also perhaps be quite interesting. Like if I mentioned, it, it's to test the law and to see how it will play out and to see how this, since precedent has been set, would it apply to other industries who are regulatory agencies and impose fines currently. Um, again, looking at that, it might also remember the, um, the government had gone on a revenue drive, especially for ministries, departments and agencies. This would impact the revenue because it acts as revenue as well for the agencies. It would impact revenue and perhaps they'd have to be more creative in in sourcing for revenue but i think it's quite important that the nbc remains fair in its um, this, in, in its discharging of its duties as a regulatory organization we appreciate the work that the nbc does because it is important to ensure that media is regulated to a certain extent however there's a stark difference between regulation and gagging a big difference move on to our, our next story lokman hekim hospitals in Turkey, and FIT Healthcare Limited Nigeria have unveiled a collaboration to de de deliver global healthcare services to the Nigerian community. Both partners will develop a world-class medical city located in the southeastern state of Enugu with further exchange of various services on patient transfers, training of doctors, hospital services, among others. These were made known at a press briefing in Lagos. Correspondent Ni Uyelo has details. Hekim Health Group is expected to share their wealth of knowledge and expertise in creating an ecosystem in Nigeria that prioritizes patient care, innovation, community well-being, and a shared vision of state-of-the-art medical tourism facility. Our collaboration with them is instructive because their business model makes sense to us. They have about nine hospitals that they run. They are outside Turkey, also in difficult areas like Iraq and so on and Iran. So we know that if they can operate successfully in those places, then Nigeria should be a cakewalk, we hope. No one wants to move away from their home. Everyone, everyone's seeking for a better life condition. This is the main idea why we want to come here because we don't want to just take patients from here. We believe in the idea, the dream Chief Loretta and her team has that they want to serve your own people in their homeland so they don't have to travel thousands of miles away. Believe me, even as a tourist, it's not very easy to go to a different country. According to Fit Healthcare Limited officials, the medical ecosystem is currently anchored on three features, which include seamless transfer of patients, 
training of doctors and health hospital services when completed. The visit of our partners from Lokma Hakim Health Group is very instructive. Coming at this time, Nigeria is going through some economic constraints. Their presence here today underscores the importance of building strong relationships required to make our project successful. The heavy responsibilities of our regular jobs is to devote time and energy to serve the friendly people of Nigeria. I'm grateful for the hard work and dedication behind the effort between the Lokman Hakim Healthcare Group and FIT health teams. The Health Tourism District is conceived not only to save lives on early diagnosis and treatment, but help reduce capital flight. The project site is located in Enugu State, Nigeria, and is expected to be completed in 2027. Ni Uilo, Arise News.